Hello, thank you for coming back to the TechBits podcast channel. And I'm here today with a very special guest, Jan Karimans. He's very one of the sharpest people I know in Postgres as well, Unity, contributes a lot. Uh, and I'm really happy to have him today here. So that said, welcome Jan, we're really happy to have you. Thank you, Doug, for inviting me. That was an absolute, absolute su delightful surprise. I'm uh, very happy to join you here today on, uh, on TechBits. Yes, definitely. Yes. Well, and what is going in, in your part of the world? What if, what are you have been working on lately? Uh, I have joined a, a new company recently. Um, it's, it's an Austrian based uh, Postgres company called CyberTech. Uh, uh, you know, one of the interesting elements of, you know, being part of, of CyberTech is actually the, the, the fact that we get to focus on pure open source Postgres. Um, I know the title of, of, of today's episode is actually, you know, Postgres, the best at being good enough. Um, and I think a colleague of mine, Hans Asma, created this presentation as part of, of one of the events that we were doing. Um, and we actually didn't even discuss this before, right? Uh, what, what the title of his kind of keynote presentation would be. And he came with this title and I thought it was so incredibly spot on. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, where Postgres is today, um, if you look at um, where it came from, if you look at the market, if you look at the industries where you know Postgres is currently part of, um, this the the title is incredibly fitting. Um, the reason why I think this this is fitting, um, you know, Postgres is as as you might know, probably know, uh, created by Dr. Mike Stonebreaker. Um, originally as ingress, and one of the key lessons that, uh, Mike Stonebreaker learned in his ingress days was actually, uh, the fact that having a system that is extensible, um, so, you know, you can add your own functions, your own, uh, data types, your own operators, um, but also create core extensions that act as if they are part of the core of Postgres makes for a system which is so incredibly versatile that um, it can basically fulfill each and any workload in each and any organization. What we in IT always have been incredibly good at is saying, oh, but you know, my workload, this is, I'm, super special company, my workload is super special, you know, I need enterprise grade software, I need the best of the best and you know, best of breed and the best of combinations or whatever, um, invest probably a lot of money as well in, in all of these, these very expensive solutions. Um, and then, you know, after so, so time you get to the conclusion that, okay, I'm using, what is it? 10, 20% of the functionality of this um, application. I'm actually, you know, having 15 systems doing 15 different, different things of which I'm all using this 10%, but I need to manage them completely. So I need staff that, you know, know this solution almost end to end to be able to, you know, have the daily operations, have system integration, have architectures in place, etc. cetera, um, which amounts for a very expensive IT operation, right? Um, yeah, it happens a lot too. A lot of companies have different databases, different types of databases it's yeah. for every different application. Yeah, I, you know, the, one of the paradigms in the business has always been, if you come, if you go to an IT conference, you know, there's bound to be a keynote speaker that says, Oh, but you know, the challenge for the organization now today is to do more with less, less IT budget, but you know, you need to do more, um, which is interesting because then from, from, you know, the initial drive says, okay, so I need even better software. I need even more software because I need to do more. Um, but then it becomes more expensive, which is also not, you know, the, the um, mission that you get, um, that you get at that point. True. 
So if you then start looking at Postgres, if you look at the vers uh, the, the extensibility system, the vers versatility of the software, all of a sudden, you know, if, if you have the guts to, you know, take a step back, if you have the guts to look at, you know, what are actually the requirements of my, my business, you know, what, what do I actually need to deliver, um, for my business to be competitive, to be, you know, up ahead, to have a leaner IT organization, to, to have more versatility, to have more agility, uh, pull, pull out your buzzword bingo cards, I would almost say, right. Um, if you then start mapping requirements to, um, to functions and features, uh, what you will start finding is that actually Postgres can meet many, many, many of these features and functions, right? You could almost say, oh, I'm looking for software that is good enough. And, you know, as an IT person, you know, working with stuff, which is good enough is, isn't really appealing. It's not appealing. If you come from a mindset that you're always driven to work with, you know, enterprise grade stuff, you know, it's, it's, um, you need to pay a lot of money. It can do, it's, it's a very powerful as feature rich and, you know, whatever. Um, if you come from that mindset and I've had many discussions with, with DBAs that, like, oh, but I can't go without, and let's just name man and horse, you know, I can't go without Oracle enterprise edition because this feature, that feature, you know, I need, um, extreme high availability. I need, you know, whatever. If you take that set of features and requirements that this person has, and if you then start looking at how can I actually do this in a world that of open source, right? Um, it might not be that extreme feature. But the feature that you have is good enough. If you look at things like, you know, Oracle real application cluster, um, and uh, this is, this is not meant to bash or anything, but this is, a, you know, a, a practical discussion I've had like hundreds of times. If you look at Oracle real application cluster, it's, it's used for, you know, high availability. But if you then start looking at. What are the actual requirements for that high availability? What are RPO, RTO times that this specific organization has, that this specific implementation has? If you then start the discussion with the person and saying, okay, so you need, you say you need 99% high availability. Do you actually know what that means? Have you done the math in, you know, how much downtime do you have? Well, they have, but then at some point in the discussion, you start finding out Oh, but the application can be done for uh, X amount of time for patching or whatever. Um, so that starts already eating into these requirements. If you then start looking at what such a solution can actually deliver, uh, you will start finding out that actually, you know, if you run Postgres in high availability mode, um, so mass of a primary replica, um, you're actually set up to, you know, meet a lot of that stuff. It does. The details are important. The devil's in the details, like they yeah. say. And that changes a lot. That happens a lot. You know, that's a big thing that you brought up because a lot of these other databases out there, aside from Postgres, they do have minimum requirements. And those minimum requirements tend to be not exactly cheap, but very expensive. So the minimum turn out to be really a different wording there needed for that minimum. Yeah. You know, and so, so, and this was just the high availability part was just one example, right? So you have, uh, um, data types running document, document style databases. So sequential data, uh, not sequential, but document based database types in a system, you know, you tend to move out to one of those document databases, like a a MongoDB, for instance, or, or some of the other players, where running JSON workloads in Postgres, we've been doing this for, what is it, over 15 years or something. Um, ever since we have had JSON in, in, in Postgres, I've had discussions with architects saying, no, oh, but, you know, for relational workloads, I use Postgres, and, you know, for uh, non-relational stuff, I use Logo. 
Why? Well, simply because they don't know that, you know, Postgres is actually better at JSON than, you know, some of the other players. Um, so that's another consolidation area where you can say, you know, I, I can actually run two or three different systems, but I can also consolidate this functionality in this one solution that's called Postgres. Um, and at some points it might just even be better, quicker. Yes, Postgres can support a lot of things. And that's one, one key thing you mentioned. There's, it's so extensible that there are so many things that one is still not even yet up to date of everything it can achieve or accomplish with Postgres. Yeah. JSON is just one of them. There's so many GIS, there's vector databases, there's all kinds of other extensions out there that one doesn't even know yeah. or that are even available there. And, you know, also sometimes, and this is, this is, you can't blame anybody and God knows I've been subject to this in the past as well. You know, you get to be in a bubble uh, and it's very hard to see outside the bubble. Um, I remember a very distinct case where an organization was still using DB2. They were running uh, DB2 on mainframe. They moved from DB2 on mainframe to DB2 on Linux, found out that this implementation wasn't as um, performant as, as the DB2 on, uh, on mainframe. So they actually invested, you know, significantly in, um, some additional technology that would make the, um, IBM DB2 running on Linux as fast as the DB2 on mainframe, which, you know, you would think wow. makes complete sense. At some point, you know, the, uh, there was a change in, in the license structures for, for DB2. And then they said, you know, this is, this is not fitting for our use case anymore. So we need to look at something else. We need to look at alternatives. They found Postgres. The funny thing is perfect. Postgres fairly well tuned, but still, you know, vanilla Postgres outperformed DB2 on Linux with the very extensive features and functionalities. They had never seen this because they were trapped in, you know, the DB2 bubble, because this is what they were used to use, to, to, to using for that. Right. Um, so that is, that is also the ability to step back in what I said earlier, step back and look at the requirements and then have the guts to, just, you know, burst your own bubble and look outside what else is there in the world that I can play with. True. And sometimes. And, and, you know, not putting blame, but a lot of times whenever you have a specific vendor, not, they don't always look after you, you know, because they want to keep you in a specific boat, yeah. as mentioned in this case, any particular database, because that's what they sell. That's what they're supporting. <laughs> so they don't want you to, to look outside of that boat. They want to keep you narrow sided and just, okay, just look this way, that way. And there's nothing else out there. That's, that's all there is. You're not going to find anything better. And that's that, what, what I said, you know, this is, this is also to your point, also not a blame thing because you, know, it, you have to have the ability also and the time and, and the, the consciousness to say, okay, so I've always been looking here, but now I need to start looking somewhere else. And why do I look that? Because there are hundreds of suppliers out there. How do you find that one thing? Um, and this is what has puzzled, it hasn't puzzled me, but it's, it's, it struck me always that, um, as Postgres is a community governed open source solution, you know, if you write a script, a database script, and you've written many doc, I know, um, if you do that and you share that with your colleague, you know, and, and he improves and gives you the script back and you hand it to somebody else in the core, this is community governed open source or you and the people around you govern that one script. Have you ever felt the need to advertise that script? I don't think so because it's, 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 it's just a tool, right? In that same mindset, Postgres is just a tool. Nobody in the community naturally has the drive to advertise for it because it's, it's, it's a tool. I'm using it. I'm extending it. I'm building it and I'm sharing it with the people around me and 
Meanwhile, the community has gotten really big and there are really a lot of organizations using it, but it's still a used tool. Nobody has the desire to advertise it in the ecosystem where, you know, the big software vendors spend millions in, in you know, marketing and, and whatever. Um, it's very, That's interesting because, yeah. You know, a lot of, uh, like they say, the best doesn't always win. You know, it's the one who markets the best a lot of times. Yes. And then you find these other contenders that they're not as good. They're not as accessible. They're not performing, but they're out there. And they're making a lot of acquisitions, a lot of uh, sales. And then Postgres is just left in the water and like, oh, it's just a database. Most, I've encountered people who say, oh, yeah, I've heard about Postgres. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. You, you, they don't go further than that. So that is what, what you said, you know, what's, what's interesting in your world. Um, this is, so this is actually one of the things that is super interesting because what we are also trying to do is actually support the community by giving a voice. Um, right to Postgres and giving visibility to Postgres and, and trying to bring the message for, you know, pure open source Postgres to just to name it like that, um, to, you know, organizations around the globe simply because nobody else does it. Right. And the technology is too cool not to do it, but it's also something that, um, you know, I had this discussion with Bruce, Bruce Bonjan, the, the, uh, uh, Bruce Yeah. Yeah. Right on. How do you bring more visibility to Postgres? You know, areas where or regions, global regions, where you know the open source message has isn't hasn't resonated as strong. Uh, not just for you know organization like mine, like CyberTech, to bring uh, you know business, but also for inspiring people to start contributing to this project. You know. I think the last number uh, of global contributors to Postgres is in, in the largest denominators, you know, building extension, working on conferences, um, helping correct manuals, translate manuals. I think that number is, is 50,000 or something. Um, wow. But we, if, if you look at um, Postgres is developing in, what is it, seven areas at the same time, right? From, from sharding to graph, what you mentioned to, you know, sheer linear performance on, on transactional work. Um, we need bright minds that could keep contributing, keep, you know, looking at the code, perfecting the code, extending the code. Um, that's, that's a continuous labor of love almost. Uh, so that's, that's another op unique opportunity that, you know, we have is, is to help also the community in that sense drive forward. Very true. And the community is pretty strong, but there definitely is room for improvement and to have a stronger voice. Sure. Because as you mentioned, there's so many more things left out there that are not making any strong awareness in the community, much less outside the community. Maybe a lot of people in the community know certain things, certain capabilities, Postgres, yeah. but outside the community, very few, if any, get to hear about it or know. I had, I had the unique opportunity to be part of a conference in, conference in, of the European Union. It was called, um, key areas for open source in, in, you know, in general. So there were uh, things like, you know, um, open source in, uh, digital automotion, um, uh, open source for, uh, Public procurement. The interesting thing, this was, this was a day filled with, you know, discussions in Brussels and in one of these, these interesting, uh, rooms. Nobody. So people were talking about IT technology. They were talking about data storage, data management. Nobody spoke about Postgres. Nobody knew about Postgres. Uh, simply because in the community, there is no drive to be part of you know, the European Union to have folks uh, doing lobbying at, at 
you know, governmental or even European level. I don't know. I don't know if you have that information, if that's more a thing in the US. I can tell you in, in Europe, it's not. Um, so one of the other elements is that, you know, we have the opportunity to actually bring Postgres into these kind of areas as well. The interesting part for that is, and my CEO at the last Postgres conference, Europe, Prague, had an interesting keynote about that. He said, you know, if today, if you have a young child, you know, the life expectancy for the child will be, what is it? At least 80 years or something, probably a hundred. That also requires that you need, or it, it doesn't require, it's, it's a logical, um, a logical thing that comes from that, that you need to store data for that person for a hundred years, right? Health records, development, you know, flu shots, whatever. Today we expect that this information will always and will be readily available. Please find me an IT organization that is guaranteed to be around for a hundred years. Yeah. It's not going to happen, right? Um, and Bruce in his presentation, will Postgres live forever? Um, had a very interesting uh, comparison to it. It was a great uh, philosopher. Why are these ideas of these Greek philosophers today still valid? Because people talk about them, work with them, think and, and, you know, have brainstorming sessions around these original ideas, which are, you know, two, three thousand years old. That is in comparison to publicly governed open source software. As long as there is a need to run data and to run maintenance and governance of data in these kind of solutions, these solutions will stay current and relevant. Um, Postgres with its extremely liberal uh, license, you know, is, is dead set to be one of those, um, that starts translating into, and, and that's, that's something that follows um, the thinking that, that was the foundation for that keynote, you know. Digital sovereignty is something, especially in, in the European region, is, is a key area, right? The ability to be independent of any software vendor when it comes to storing your data. If you go to a traditional software vendor and you have your data, you put your data in that database system, you're officially only allowed to touch and work with your data if you pay that company, which is, if you start yeah. thinking about it, it's a very crazy idea because everybody says, oh, it's your data. And if you look at a lot of the new compliance laws and, and a lot of that other, you know, requirements getting, um, getting stood up, you have to be master of your own data. So that also means that and that very little. If, if you run well, yeah, a proprietary that's... solution, yeah. It definitely, there's many formats and databases have died with time. Yeah. Informix, there people heard about it. <laughs> Land coding language is the same thing. They're extinct yeah. or close to extinction. They get revived somehow. Yeah. I mean, and then you're stuck with the data. What do you do with the data? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, in, in the preparation for this call, we were talking about COBOL and, you know, maintaining COBOL applications and how incredibly hard it is to find people who are fluent in COBOL, even though we know that a lot of the core banking systems are still running on COBOL systems, right? That's, that's a little bit scary. If you look at what the big hyperscalers are doing today, you know, they are not just locking the database format, but also locking where it's stored, you know, having the ability to move in, move out, uh, or lift and shift your data somewhere else is limited by, you know, what they decide is possible or impossible. And in that case, as you said, we're not the master of our own data. No. Somebody else yeah. is. 
So in that, bring that back to, uh, to Postgres, um, that gives you that ultimate control. Uh, for me, a very interesting other angle in that sense is also the way that you can actually start deploying um, these systems. Um, we all know, and I've said this before, you know, Postgres is a community governed open source system. Um, for me, the interesting part is that, you know, modern deployments of database systems is, is done on, you know, container, containerized infrastructures. The interesting part is that if you look at how you manage a containerized infrastructure, you know, one of the, the, the first things that comes to mind is Kubernetes. And if you look at the history of Kubernetes, if you look at where it's now, you know, it, it originally came from Google. Um, it was the, the friendly Borg, right? Um, the Borg system was, you know, the found, foundational technology behind the Google search engine. Uh, to, Excuse me. And, you know, a couple of guys made this open source, right? So if you get to this ecosystem where you can run data in Postgres and you can deploy it in you know, a very easy manner, a very, you know, only, only potent manner, like running Postgres on Kubernetes and that, you know, builds a whole new way of um, then looking back at digital sovereignty, you know, data, the, the data portability, the flexibility required and expected these days from modern application architectures, you know, bringing those two together. Postgres is a community governed open source system owned by the Postgres Global Development Group. Kubernetes is a public, you go, publicly governed open source solution managed by CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, you know, bringing those together then gives you the ability to basically do anything. Um, and I think this is one of the most exciting um, things that's happening currently in, uh, in IT. Um, obviously I'm biased because I'm a database person. Uh, for me, this is one of the most exciting uh, things that, that can happen, right? Exciting times. Yeah, that's definitely open source has been picking up a lot more the last few years and it keeps on picking up speed. The question is how long would it last too? You know, uh, go, everything goes in cycle. I hope it stays, you know, and, and I think, uh, how, how many times has SQL been pronounced dead? Do you still keep up with the count? You know, SQL has been pronounced dead for, a, as, for 20, 30, 40 years already. Uh, MapReduce and, and um, Hadoop would be the new thing. Then you know, DBAs would die and it would be data lakes. And you know you would store data just in S3 buckets and you know, what else? Um, the... Fundamental thing is that if you want to do something with data, you need to be able to analyze it. Analyzing data is done by asking questions of it. You ask questions of data in a structured way, structured query language, SQL. And if you look at that, um, and if you look at all of the new things, what we, we talked about graphs and uh, you know AI and all of that stuff. I have in my head always this analogy with a tree, a big, big, strong tree trunk and a lot of branches. These branches are all of these new ways of managing and, and analyzing data, but they're all stuck to this one big firm trunk, which is called SQL. Everything always will come back to SQL. So as the branches get stronger, SQL itself will get stronger because it needs to uphold the branch, right? Uh, so that's, that's at least for me, and, and I don't know if people agree or disagree, but that's at least, you know, how I looked at this and what, what I've seen happening, you know, over, what is it, the last 15 years or something. Yeah, there, there's come after SQL, as you're right, the big data, then Hadoop, which all these are spark, then the new SQL and the no SQL, but 
SQL still going strong. Yeah. They've been trying to get rid of it and it just keeps on going. Yeah. You know, it, it's hard. So, you know, if, if you then, you know, take a step back and, you know, look at all of the things that, you know, in, in this episode so far, we talked about around, you know, Postgres with its digital sovereignty with, you know, consolidation of, of many systems into this one solution. Um, and then looking at modern day requirements for architectures, for you know, new agile microservices application, which, which has been deemed also buzzword for a long time with like that. People saying, you know, oh, you know, we're not, we're not going to do microservices again. We're not going to whatever. But if you look at where organizations are moving from their traditional monolithic systems, it might not necessarily be microservices in, in the true definition, but they're all talking about, I need to break up this application into much more smaller and manageable chunks. Um, and that in my idea is still, you know, working with services. Um, so that keeps on feeding the system that, you know, a big old fashioned, big storage where, you know, we're going to pump like 50 terabytes of data and then we're going to launch on that for, uh, for hours on end, you know, this starts to change. This is, this is getting smaller. This is getting more flexible. This is getting more, you know, quickly accessible, quickly movable from one infrastructure to another. As we need the data to to move and to be uh, to be available at any time, because you know, this is this is what modern day um, you know we we all have a phone. The phone has an app. The app needs to work. It needs to get the data. It needs to get the data fast. Um, so you can get things like data on the edge, etc. Which all sounds cool, but if you if you look at realistic implementations and then think back on. You know, the groundbreaking work that Stonebreaker and in, in, in his footsteps, uh, Mungjin have been doing, is, you know, building Postgres and keeping Postgres alive and keeping the extensibility system there, et cetera, um, is actually something that's benefiting, you know, data management at a global scale today. You know, it, it, I find that exciting and fantastic. Yeah, there's so many trends. <laughs> that one that was quite interesting, as you mentioned, with the microservices one. First, it was the killer for monolithics yeah. applications, and now many are just getting off of it. They didn't like the performance of it. The same with the cloud. Yeah. You know, everything was buzzword, cloud, 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 and now they're going back to on-premise because it doesn't always work well. Well, then that's actually a very interesting observation, right? If, if you are an organization, you have an application, and the application has one single function that's move data from A to B, you know, like I have... I have a factory to ring and, you know, there is stuff being built in location A and then needs to move to location B for further processing. What on earth can ever be cheaper than having dedicated card running between location A and location B, probably or preferably on a set of rails, so it will run the same route back and forth with minimum, uh, minimum effort, minimum investment. You can run this thing for... 50 years, you know, you oil the cogs every now and then it will just keep on going. Why on earth would you take this solution and make it fancy? The requirement is go from A to B. You can build fancy international or fancy off-site whatever infrastructure. The only thing what it will do is we'll make it more expensive. And, you know, that's one of the things that I think of the biggest push for that are those buzzwords, as you mentioned, buzzwords, buzz, buzz, buzz. They just generate buzz and everybody goes and locks to it and, oh, that's the latest thing. So let's do it. But they haven't researched it well. And then they come back and with, you know, defeated, you know, like, oh, he wasn't all that it was supposed to be, but you know, it's, no surprise. The, they didn't do due diligence. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The, the deep marketing pockets of, you know, hyperscalers and you know, why do they have this, why do this, do they do this investment in trying to get you to use their infrastructure? Because if you're in, you're in it and it's very hard to get out. And this is what a lot of organizations are now figuring out. I've invested, you know, I don't know how much in the cloud infrastructure, 
But I now find out that going from A to B was actually cheaper doing it on prem with my own box, which has been running for 30 years, which has been paid off for the last 25 years, right? So it was free, basically. I just used some power. And now I'm on this big, fancy international uh, hyperscaler infrastructure and, and it's killing my budgets. Now I want to go back, but going back is then not so easy. Anymore. Yeah, and they keep you hostage, you know? Once your data is in, you got to pay to get it out. And that, that is <laughs> that's what justifies these big marketing budgets. And this is, this is what, for me, been one of the painful points of, of working in IT, basically, you know, getting stuck into the buzz of the latest and greatest and getting stuck in the buzz of those marketing budgets. Uh, where, as to your, your point, you know, if you do your own due diligence and you do it well, you will find out. Actually, you know, running this this own piece of hardware on my my own site, uh, there are um, stone factories, brick factories, which have been running, you know, PDP deck PDP two for sixty years, seventy years. Um, you know, they can still get spare parts, and why why on earth would I do something else? It needs to manage the oven to bake the bricks. The, the PDP still does that, right? Why would it do something else? Why would you replace that with, you know, a cloud infrastructure solution that you need to build a pipe to, you know, the internet, move data back and forth. It makes no sense. Yeah. And that's hard part because a lot of the time the decisions come from above and they're just the buzz, you yeah. know, they're like, oh, it's a hot thing to do. Next thing to do. And then everybody else gets the blame, but those who make the decision. Yeah. And, was, you know, like, oh, we're going to have to let go people because I made a bad decision. But wait a minute. I made the bad decision, but you guys are going to pay yeah. for it. Not me. I'm going to keep my bonus and everything else, you know. Yeah. I'm going to keep my seat and everybody else has to go. Yeah. It's just not me. <laughs> so that is, you know, that, that is the, one of the things that I think open source and, you know, open source in general, and Postgres specifically, uh, will continue to make an impact. So I think, you know, to, to answer your question a little bit, you know, will it be around for a very long time? I, I think so. Um, you know, as long as there is demand for the functionality, demand for, you know, what the features or functions of this piece of software are, um, uh, I think the software will just stay relevant and people will continue to work with it. Very much like, you know, Doc's script, which actually is excellent at doing the backup and checking backups, et cetera, making sure that it's not a prayer on tape. Um, you know, as long as people need that, they will keep using your script. I think that's, yeah. that's it. That's a fair point. Yeah. That's, you got right on point there. It's things keep on working. Sometimes as simple as just good enough. Sure. But back to the title of the episode, yeah. <laughs> the best at being good enough. Postgres, the best at being good enough. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, what I said, you know, in the beginning as well, you need to have for yourself, the guts to, to evaluate, do your due diligence, figure out that, Hey, actually for what I really and truly need to do, you know, this stuff just works. Why would I invest more? Why would I diverge? Uh, and true there there will be use cases where you know postgres will not be a good fit but they those will be extreme use cases but then again for those extreme use cases it also um makes sense to invest a little bit more in specific technology uh, nine out of ten times 99 out of 100 times you know postgres will just simply do the job yes that's accurate it's a solid, strong database. Before, many would still be unaware and say, oh, it's not solid, it's not proven. It's been proven for a long oh, time. Yes. We've, we've seen implementations and, you know, Postgres run in places where you think this, this just can't be true from, you know, transaction volumes, from storage volumes, from analytic volumes. Uh, if you if you take a little bit of time and dig into that history, you will find so many opportunities where Postgres is doing cool stuff that uh, your use case will probably be part of that, and you will most probably find um, somewhere so, somewhere someone who has written a blog about it or actually did the implementation already, 
uh, created a bit of extra functionality in script or whatever around Postgres to make it do what you need it to do. Yes, and there's a lot of talent out there, like yourself, that have that, that experience and can guide others, help them through those turbulent times, you know, that turbulent process of, because many people get scared, you know, like, oh, I'm, we're going to move from this to this and I'm unsure I haven't done it. Yeah. Right. But there's talent like yourself that can help them. Tell them, easy, easy. We'll help you. Right. We'll guide you. Yeah. We'll it's get just, there. We'll get to the finish line. You know, uh, not, not to pet, our, pet ourselves on the shoulder, but if you look at what, what Cybertech has been doing in the Postgres community for the last 25 years, if you look at, you know, the blogs that we've written, um, tools, many open source tools also that and smaller and larger, uh, but also contributions to, you know, the core of Postgres. And, and if you then start looking at organizations that we, uh, you know, are honored enough to, to guide on their Postgres journey, um, you know, there is a lot of, of opportunity for, uh, other organizations around the globe that are now starting to figure out, hey, Postgres is actually a very interesting piece of technology. We're obviously happy to to help uh, guide on on the journey, and you know, figure out if if that due diligence actually tells you that it can be done with Postgres or that you know you need something else. Definitely, yeah. And CyberTech has done a great job. I'm glad they have you there because I think uh, Hans also published a book. One post, I remember reviewing it. Yeah. And did a good job. Uh, yeah, I think it did really well. Yeah. And, and the new version of the new edition, I should say, for the new version of Postgres is is, is about to come out. And so, uh, Postgres 17. Um, so, that, you know, go figure, go find out the book. Um, it, it is a true Bible for a lot of, uh, you know, if you're a little bit more technical, um, you know, there is a lot of good information in that book, definitely. Yeah, it's a great resource there. Any other ideas, thoughts that you might have for the all the viewers? Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, we had we a fairly broad discussion from, you know, Postgres uh, extensibility system, the good enough through digital sovereignty to deployments. Um, you know, I think you just about exhausted my brain here for, uh, for this episode, uh, Doc. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure there's more to it. I just, we're just tired right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to pick your brain in another episode. Then. Okay. But yeah. it's been really great to have you. You have such wealth of information, knowledge there to share. And I'm glad things, if you're holding the torch over there and making sure that everything is moving great over there with CyberTech and in Europe, it's, it's amazing. Cool. And well, what I said, thank you for having me. It's, it's been absolutely an honor. You know, we, we had the opportunity to work together in the past. I'm looking forward to, you know, new options, new rounds, new challenges in, in, you know, the next stint in our lives. Same likewise here. And we'll see you in the next episode there. I'll reach out sometime soon. Cool.